and just to give you a, a quick summary of um of Fleur Tristan's life how it was portrayed um the important bits of it that might come back uh, to haunt us so you can see she didn't live a long life she died at the age of 41 from overwork going around france uh, she's considered she was considered a singular woman even in her lifetime uh, she had interesting family background of uh, french and peruvian origins her parents didn't uh, uh, formalize their marriage so she was considered illegitimate uh, unhappily married and a reluctant mother, much has been written about that. She was of modest background, but an, a traveler of many countries. Um, and the, she's the author of books that I'm not really going to concentrate on today. Um, Peregrinations of a Pariah is about her Peruvian uh, trip. Promenade dans Londres is her London journal. And Union Ouvrière is addressed to French workers. The family uh, side of, or if you like, the which might have been the holders of her memory, um, is, is that she, her, her two sons uh, more or less vanished without trace, but her daughter, Aline, married uh, a, a journalist of Republican sympathies who fled France in 1849 uh, when things got too hot uh, for the left in, uh, in France. And uh, you see that the names of two children, uh, Paul Gauguin stands out. Now, he wasn't important uh, to Precious story, but, uh, it's, it's of interest. So the, I'm talking about the afterlives of these people of Florent Tristan and you will see of uh, Jules Prech, but particularly um, the afterlife, what happened to her papers, what happened to her name, what happened to her uh, memory is a, uh, uh, has been of increasing importance to me because it was the last part of her life where she really was a labor activist where she labored with uh, the working class in an endeavor to emancipate the working class. And in fresh papers, to which I, I gained access, there's this, uh, you know, quite a gloomy uh, old photo, black and white photograph. You can see there are railings around the grave side and it's a, the grave side, the, gra the, the monument is a broken column. Um, so that, I don't think he ever visited it, but anyway, Bordeaux is the site of her death. Now, I visited it uh, this, um, whenever I could, and I was very pleased I did visit it in 2010, because what did I find? But a trade union plaque to the memory of Florence Piston, which wasn't there in 1908. I, you, I don't know if you can see the dates, but it's the CGT, the Confédération Générale du Travail, uh, the regional branch, which has put up a plaque to Florence Piston in the um, 150th anniversary of her death and to, uh, naming her militante féministe et révolutionnaire. So that's not what she was called when she died. She was called the mother of the workers. So there's a shift you can see in the memory of, uh, of Florent Tristan. And uh, on the top, I, don't, I hope you can see, on the top of this broken column is the book. And she, if anybody toasted her, she would refuse and say, no, we're toasting the book, the idea of the workers' union, which was a call to form a, work, an, a universal association of solidarity. It was published by a subscription, um, you see in 1843, 1844, she, no, no publisher would touch it uh, without um, the funds. And this, this is the book that attracted the attention of the first labor historians about which I'm going to talk. Uh, Benoit Malon and Jules Presch uh, both used it in their, um, their accounts of the early uh, French labor movement. So that's the link, if you like. Without knowing anything more about her, they could have just talked about that. Um, because it was contemporary to other writers, it was part of the, the flow of, if you like, the ideas of uniting the working class, getting working class organized, uh, to and especially to emancipate themselves, which is what she considered should be done. And so, if you like, not only did she write a program of action, for a labor movement. But the second work, which is directly related to the labor movement, is her work on the Tour of France, uh, Tour of France, sorry. And it, it, that uh, was an undertaking she made in imitation of other campaigners, of the, of the journeymen. Uh, it wasn't her invention to go from time to time, but she, to go from time to time she did. She covered 22 times in the summer of 1844. 
and literally died of exhaustion and uh, a fever in, in Bordeaux. But that the, mis the mystery around this one is that um, the, it's a post she wrote her diary, she wrote an account of, uh, of, of reactions, of, of how she was received in each town, and it vanished without trace until 1973. And therefore, it was always, always this, uh, to me, there was always this mystery, you know, why this, why this gap, you know, where, where did the book go to, how was it preserved, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a long story short, even though other people are interested in uh, for other reasons, uh, the art historians got working on her, you know, Gauguin's astonishing grandmother. It was only a matter of time before that would come out. Uh, and um, the, the, that and other works in the 1980s and 1990s, all of them, um, all of them referred to uh, the, um, the, the ideas of Florent Christo and of her, of her life. Now, she herself, I, I don't know this one as well, she herself was conscious of how ideas can be dropped, how ideas can come and go, how people's lives can come and go. And just as a, you know, an acknowledgement to the fact that she did have an, a knowledge of radicalism in, in this country, um, she uh, wrote about Mary, she, was she wrote about her astonishment that Mary Wollstonecraft should be forgotten that uh, her work, the uh, the rights of women, um, you know, she she was she, she writes in in France that uh, nobody's heard of her. Um, she's sort of making quite possibly an exaggerated claim that nobody had heard of her in the eighteen forties. So conscious that you know she can be forgotten, um, and she also makes a link, and uh, and which we I think we all try to do in our efforts to discover where ideas come from, follow them up, where they go to. Uh, she makes a link as to, um, you know, how Mary Wollstonecraft had proclaimed ideas, principles that were then repeated uh, in following generations. And for instance, she, met, she specifically mentioned Saint-Simon and his, his followers in the 1830s. So uh, what happens to her ideas? Um, I'm, I'm going to briefly say that, uh, you know, in the, I was part of uh, the, 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 you know, 1989 was the year of the publication of my thesis. I was part of a generation of women who uh, wrote about, the, who discovered women in history. And um, the, the uh, I take absolutely no credit for, um, you know, for, 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 uh, for trying to write about her in an original way, because I, I read as many secondary sources as I could, and including reading poetry. So, and my, actually, my, my idea was to write about the relationship between feminism and socialism in the life. And that was my interest, and it still is my key interest, how feminism and socialism evolved. Um, uh, the, the, one of the best books in English, uh, it, Susan Brogan wrote a pretty good book uh, in, in the style of the new biography that women, gender uh, historians were using to, to, you know, to sort of um, talk about her, her kind of her self-representation uh, the headings of, you know, a singular woman, a victim of male oppression, megastar, original thinker. Those are the chapter headings that, uh, that Brogan uses. But I kind of have been, I was not... 100% happy with this approach of homing in on the person. I still think, you know, uh, that we have to be very careful with this. And so, like this neglect, uh, claiming that she was forgotten, it became the source of indignation for early 20th century generations of activists. Uh, for instance, Ellen Bahillon was, was outraged that Marx hadn't acknowledged, and this is, you know, 1919, um, that Marx hadn't acknowledged from Christian. And if you like, they're drawn in by this life story of, of if you like, stardom of this woman who, who, who'd made something of herself, who, who, you know, against all odds became a writer and became a, a worker at the heart of the, um, the French working movement, even if it was only briefly. And so I, my dissatisfaction or my, my, my thirst for doing more on her was this idea that somehow her agency in the labour movement was being sort of shifted to one side. And I thought it was time to bring her back into, uh, into the story of, of, of labour activism and, um, 
and its afterlife in, in its kind of uh, her afterlife in labor history. And so, uh, you know, I'm talking about, I thought there was a dead end to that, that, that sense of, you know, um, genre of biography of, 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 of feminism. So um, I, I uh, and the other fascinating thing is, which I won't go into, is that there has been no decent historical biography of Florent Tristan in French. It's, it, there's a constant regurgitation of on using the secondary sources um, of, of her life. And I am actually completing a translation of my book uh, it, into French with, with a colleague I'm, who's doing the translating. I'm looking for the, the, to persuade the publisher, but I'm really hoping that that book will make an impact on, 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 on French scholarship. And I'll talk about that later if you want. So, um, business of what's missing uh, from from you know, what was missing from the missing elements in labor in or if you like the, the a possible new emphasis on Florent Tristan was also part of my restlessness about how labor history has treated Florent Tristan if they have treated her at all and you know the limitations of labor history for instance how do you insert a single woman into the labor history movement without making her a superstar and how do you um, talk about uh, people who are just about forgotten and how do you talk about the little people who have been laboring in between the big superstars of saint Simon and all the rest. So I wanted to, I wanted to interrogate labor history as well as interrogating the way we've, um, uh, we've written about, um, about uh, Florent Tristan. And so I kind of came to Jules Quetch, uh, not immediately, um, because I, I, I don't know why, I think it was because I was kept looking back at the diary of it of 1973. And I had also uh, had the privilege of, of uh, finding letters in that were deposited in a library in Castro. And I talk about it, I do actually explain in my book how, how I got to this point of being able to use quest papers. Um, the, uh, so I was looking at the latter part of uh, Florence Christian's life, her diary that was lost. Where is her diary? Where's the manuscript? It's in Amsterdam. Why is it in Amsterdam? You know, why did I not start asking that question a long time ago? Uh, it's in the Institute of International Social uh, History. So uh, Jules Puech, I finally come to, and it, turned, it was like a ripe apple waiting to fall because by the time I went back to Castro, I had my career established. I was able to walk in and say, look, you know, I'm a professor of history. I want to do this book. And people opened their doors and uh, invited me to give lectures, etc., etc. So I got to Jules Quesh eventually. And um, I, uh, this, who, you know, why did he write a biography of Florent Tristan? Why was it published in 1925, etc., etc. So I had all these questions and I started to uh, look at them and uh, unravel uh, what became a fascinating story. So, um, you know, obviously, is it a hagiography that he writes? Is it how critical is he, etc.? Uh, I can, you know, I can talk about his biography later, but it's, I'm talking about the biographer today. So I thought this is a really good way to contextualize an activist, how the activist is remembered, how he discovered her. And also he, as an artisan of labor history, he was one of the pioneers, uh, you know, he was an amateur historian, but he's still a pioneer. You know, he creates, he creates an archive, he creates a history uh, of Florent Tristan, and that is part of the early history of socialism in, in, in France. So it was really, uh, it was really uh, a terrific subject uh, to, to get into, and there's a lot I couldn't uh, work on. So when he came to work on Florent Tristan, what, what had happened in France? Well, you know, I don't need to, um, you know, to dwell much on this, but you know, the, the fact that the early history, the early utopian socialist movement had been discredited by the failure of the Second Republic in France. There'd been a movement, there'd been some time of repression, but there'd been the rise of Marxism. Um, then, of course, there was the, uh, the in France, there was a big struggle between uh, Marx and Proudhon for, for uh, influence over the, 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 the labor movement. And then, you know, Jules Quesh comes along and he was working, his interest was in the 1840s and activists. He was, in fact, he became an editor of Proudhon's books. He was a major uh, part of the team of the, you know, complete works of, of, of Proudhon. So he was a beaver. He was a, he was, 
paid a lot of, he had a great, you know, skill of paying attention to detail. He would, you know, look, he would go on the, on, on the hunt for, pardon me, for, um, for his, his, his sources, et cetera, et cetera. So he was part of a new class of scholarly activists, what I call scholarly activists, who he was also convinced by his ideals to work in uh, certain um, in, in certain movements, not you know, some of them quite remote, you could say at first sight from the labor movement, for instance, he was a pacifist. He was a pacifist. He was part of the new pacifists of the 1900s who believed that peace through arbitration, that international disputes should be settled through our international arbitration. Um, the Peace Palace in uh, The Hague being one of the uh, foundations of that key idea. And yet he he joined he joined up and and, and fought what he believed to be uh, military uh, German military aggression. So you know uh, who, who, you could say that he that removes him from any you know identity or sort of uh, allegiance to a labour movement. He was he wasn't a, from working class origins. He was an educated man uh, from from of, of of from a comfortably off background. So you know you could say what's he doing in in, in the labour movement. But my argument was he was as a, as a as an artisan of history. He was an activist in labour history, and he wasn't alone. Um, my Louise Presh is another is part of another part of this sort of galaxy of of of, of people that we have to look at. Um, she was his lifelong companion and, uh, and 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 very active in her own right. So they, if you like, they're at the intersection of third public. Uh, politics of activism, feminism, moderate feminism, socialism, pacifism, threads of internationalism, nationalism running through the, their, their lives. And um, they're from the a Protestant milieu of Castro. Um, they both um, aspired to being, uh, you know, intellectuals, academics. Toulouse was uh, where Presh did his first um, degree, then he moved to the Paris and Sorbonne, and uh, um, his wife, his to be his his friend at the time, uh, went off to Mont Montreal and was a a, um, a a lecturer in McGill University for eight years before she came back. So their places of activism was they lived in Paris um, until the um, France was invaded and he lost his job. Um, uh, he, he worked in the foreign office, he lost his job, and they, uh, he was in his 60s by then, they quickly um, realised that they should get out anyway, and they retired to Bohi Blanc near Castro. Uh, Bohi Blanc is a very significant word. Uh, if I don't mention it again, you must ask me. Anyway, they, um, they, 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 so the, the sites of this, these archives are not Paris for me, it became Bohi Blanc and Castro. Um, the, there has been attention given to them, uh, they, and this is because they um, left a legacy of papers. They left an enormous houseful of papers, and um, they, when they were separate from, they began their friendship really through correspondence. My Louise Presh and Julie wrote to one another across the Atlantic, that, and um, they kept their letters. Uh, when they were separated, uh, in when Jules went to the front, very interesting letters from the, the two two sides survive, and um, uh, Hemi Casals, who's a, a very um, prolific uh, labour historian. Uh, he published their letters. He works on the first world. So he, that was for me, that was a godsend, a big, thick, um, you know, set of letters already, already published. So, um, uh, they, they, that, so that's been made public. And uh, this is a, a picture of them in their home in Bohé Blanc. There's a typewriter in front of my Louise. She typed everything. And we, there's no proof, but I think she typed a lot of stuff for him, for, for, for Jules. Uh, she was his, you know, she was his, she was his correspondent. Uh, she replaced him in the, in the committees for the Mouvement de la Paix in the, uh, when he was at the front. Um, and she then, she, she was also a, a feminist and an activist in her own right in international conferences for the suffrage and for peace in the 1920s. So this is what I had, and here is their tombstone with two very dear friends of mine um, who, in Castle, I, you know, I just was, had, I've made friends for life. This is the Protestant cemetery. This is not the municipal, cemetery, municipal local 
uh, cemetery. The Protestants have their own cemetery. And the little square on the right of the uh, of that uh, that um, uh, stone effigy um, construction, you see, that's um, I don't think she's buried there, but that's the name of their servant. Their, their person who was with them all their life. So, uh, you know, behind uh, every forgotten couple or every, there's another person that you think, who is she, what did she do, you know? Um, but anyway, uh, so I, I did have a lot of fun uh, going around. Um, uh, um, the, the people who met, I met would try say, oh, have you seen such and such a house? That's where they live. That's where they live. So, you know, it was really quite a, a personal uh, a personal touch to kind of resurrecting the, um, the, 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 the life of this couple. Uh, by the way, Jules died in 1957. And Mary died in 1957. So it was very... And this is a kind of a thing that I drew out, um, just to remind myself to tell you, you know, that the, by 1912, by the time he went to war, Jude Quest was very well connected with many uh, organisations which crossed over, uh, you know, um, that's the one on the peace movement um, and uh, um, the, the sort of the um, moderate left. Uh, he was never a member of the Socialist Party. He was never a member of a trade union, but um, sort of the, um, the, the 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 kind of associations that uh, were, were were growing in the in France of the of the early twentieth century. And we have to remember that they, you know, it was it was a a, a republic which was now maturing. Political parties were allowed to form after nineteen hundred and one. So there was you know sort of a, a plethora of, of organisations which which grew up at that time. The, what he published at the end of the war was uh, the reminder of the socialist tradition and pacifism, how pacifists were the socialists, and he meant, of course, the utopian socialists. And qu quite movingly, he he dedicates the book to his to his companions who died in the, in in the war. But the fact of the matter is, Esch took sixteen years to write the biography of Flora Tristan. Um, and it took me quite some time to work through how, you know, how did he, why 16, why did he take 16 years? And um, what stopped him or what, you know, what helped him? Um, so the the first, the, the, it is in his letters that I find the trace. He doesn't write down in his biography, he doesn't say, he doesn't do a self-reflection that I'm doing. He doesn't say, this is how I, I went about the book. He just gets straight in and starts off with the life of the truth. Um, so in 1908, he married my Louise Pesch, and things did if you like, speed up a bit uh, after that. But he did discover her when he was writing his first thesis in um, on on the uh, on Proudhonian influence on the first uh, Workers International. Um, he, he included union. He included Flora Tristan's Workers Union as in a few pages, and that's that we know that from, you know, he published his thesis in 1907. Uh, in the letters, he talks about how he um, is meeting such and such to look through their archives to see if there's anything on Flora Tristan. So the letters, I was very hopeful. He like he writes in great detail in his letters. I was really hopeful that I would find a eureka moment. Guess what? I've just been handed the diary and the letters of Flora Tristan. Uh, by such and such. No, that didn't happen, you know. Um, so I had to sort of find ways of talk, of constructing, uh, you know, knowing that by 1912, he definitely had seen the letters and he'd read them and he'd read her diary uh, that was never published. But he would use those. He had them in his personal possession for uh, a very long time. So um, the I never did find out how he found the person who um, who held the letters after Florent Tristan's death? Um, I had I had worked on those letters. Um, Florent Tristan, when she was going around uh, France, uh, received many letters, and in the, we don't know how many. We don't know if it's some total. But when she died in Bordeaux, she had in her possession her diary, written on a just on exercise books and uh, nearly 300 letters that she was carrying with her and probably would have published some of them in her intended publication. 
And um, the, 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 the Jules Puech sourced, he, he got to uh, who held the um, who held the letters, the, those documents, um, by by um, by by his knowledge of the the whole of the utopian socialist movement. It wasn't just the knowledge of Florent Tristan. It was the knowledge of um, the Lemoniers who had hosted Florent Tristan. Uh, it was the knowledge of the Fourierists, etc. So he beavered away. He would attend annual dinners for in memory of them. So he's kind of just at the cusp. Fifty years after she died, he he knew people who, if you like. We're carrying on the flames of the memory of these uh, utopian socialists. Um, so the, the papers were scattered. Um, the uh, you know the, the 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 kind of and I suppose this is what we're all concerned about. You know how to find how to use how to use sources, how to use how to find the papers in the first place, and how to. Um, you know how best to exploit them, but um, the the extraordinary. I did in, in my book there's a chapter of the extraordinary story of the the circumstances of Florence Christian's death. Her family, her her, her uh, you know her blood group family, they didn't take the papers. They didn't use them. They didn't hold them. It was her political family. She had a disciple of, uh, whom she called her daughter from Lyon called Eleanor Blanc, who is the saviour of the day, because Eleanor Blanc was bequeathed these, um, the diary, manuscript, and the letters. And uh, Jules Puech found the descendants of Eleanor Blanc. He did, she, de, Eleanor Blanc uh, didn't live, I think, it, beyond the 1860s, but uh, Jules Puech found that the family, the son and the uh, family had kept in out of respect for the memory of uh, of Florent Tristan. And just to, to illustrate how these sort of these these kind of um, links are made, I assumed, and many others with me assumed that Eleanor Blanc, okay, she was in Lyon, and that was that. Not a bit of it in his papers, which he didn't use for his biography. I find uh, letters from the family to Jules Puech thanking him for taking the, uh, you know, the trouble to send them a copy of his book, and uh, 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 holding the record that Eleanor Blanc went to Paris for the second for the declaration of the Second Republic, and that she worked as a carer in the prison. Um, for, for, as, a, as a nurse in the prison uh, until she was sacked by um, by um, uh, what's his name? Louis Napoleon and uh, his, his his regime. In other words, she was a, a Republican sympathizer of the Second Republic, which had included so many of the demands that Lord Tristan had made. And in fact, it it so those paper. It's a miracle they survived. The son of Eliana Blanc be, became an engineer and went to Chile and was as an engineer to uh, work for the Chilean government and th there was a um, there was a coup d'etat and he somehow survived and came back and you know the question is how on earth did those papers survive all of that so you know that was kind of a, a, a good a good a good yarn to tell and then the other end of this the, the story, and I'm probably going to have to finish soon. The other end of the um, the, the, the story about this same manuscript, Flora Tristan's diary, is that Jude Quesh sold it in the 1930s to raise money for this same family. And who did he sell it to? He negotiated a price, and I've got the letters. He negotiated a price with the Institute of International Institute of Social History, which had a branch in Paris. He never went to Amsterdam. He sold it to the people who were founding it. The same branch that was taking in all the papers of the anti-fascists, all the papers of the refugees from the East-West that were happening in Europe in the 1930s. And he handed over his type manuscript of the diary to the people in uh, Paris who, who were going to publish it. In the, and what happens, of course, Second World War, occupation of France, occupation of the Netherlands, the contents, as you might know, of the International Institute of Social History were hidden. They were, the place was emptied. And the question never saw that manuscript again. He never saw the diary again because it was lost. It was lost in the hiding and it only resurfaced just about in 1957 when he died. So it's it's quite a sad story, 
But amazingly, it sat that sat there. And there's another person I'd love to know more about. The person who did publish it in 1973 was called Michel Collinet, who was an activist uh, in uh, all his life. He was a resistant. He was um, um, a historian of the of the of the uh, I think of, of some of the labor movement, but. Uh, he and he was apparently he was 69 when he published this, and I, he he died shortly afterwards. So I I never know, and I can't find anything about him either. And I'd love to know why did he why was he inspired? Because he writes a very self-effacing but you know very short introduction. He doesn't say this is how I find this, and you know. Uh, so um, this is uh, I'd, I've included some picture of me working when I found precious letters. They were in the family papers in chaos. And they, this was my, con these were my conditions of reading, sitting on a bed, surrounded by higgledy piggledy, the family, the great niece of uh, Jules Presch, who did, the, the, uh, Jules Presch, and my Louise Presch didn't have children, they had nieces and nephews. Um, the great niece heard me give a lecture in Castle uh, about my, the beginnings of my work of, uh, on Florent. Uh, Flora Christian's biographer, and she had heard that I was going to talk about Jules Presch, her great uncle. So she came down from Montauban to Castres and announced that she had his papers uh, and that I was welcome. And she welcomed me with open arms to, uh, to but there, it, she has since deposited them. We helped her sort of, you know, do a bit of um, classical or, or, you know, ordering of the boxes. But she she has so she has deposited them in the public archive in in, in Albi in the in. But I, it it was just uh, luckily for camera luckily for cameras I did not transcribe the letters I just took many many photographs. So it, you know the press detective work was, went could have taken me in many directions. Uh, his his detective work went in several directions. Um, he had connections with. with through his interest in the early utopians, it was more he was interested in much more than just Florent Tristan. Um, he he found uh holders of papers who would possibly have given him uh access to the Eleanor Blanc family, but the, I cannot pinpoint exactly who. Uh, the, the scattered um correspondence from the letters from Florent Tristan from her death onwards, uh, you know, they have. They've, they've led mostly it's the letters to the, the working the working people the working men and some women who were interested in what she had to say um the family more or less died out even though she had a famous grandson um it was the the professors and scholars of the of early history uh, the early history of socialism in france that you know helped Kresh construct. That became his family. And I've mentioned, uh, well, Tibert, Marguerite Tibert, um, Luc Andler, uh, is, I could tell you a lot about him. He, he was uh, responsible for translating a version of Marx and Marx's Communist Manifesto into, into France. And he really encouraged, he thought, um, he thought press should work on Florent Tristan. Didn't stop him from saying that she was a hysterical mm -hmm. woman, but uh, um, that's another matter. So I, I kind of put up, I want to find a picture of the galaxy of stars, but I put up the planet Earth, which is what we're sitting on here, and kind of, you know, we have to work with what we've got, but out there, you know, kind of tantalizingly, you know, how what would I give to have a research student or someone who could follow more you know, dig dig further, see if we can find more. Um, bringing out people like Eleanor Blanc, um, who was an activist herself, fellow students of press who helped him, uh, women activists in the international movement. I think it was through that network that the International History Museum History Group in in um, Holland and in the Netherlands found question and asked him would he be interested in 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 uh, handing over the manuscript so the, it, it's kind of uh you know it, it's 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 a never-ending task but it's 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 i've had i have had to limit my looking at question through flora tristan but if we took away flora tristan i would have a lot more to say but his whole profile of knowledge of and, uh, uh, and of his work as an activist um, made him the best person to be the biographer of, of, of Florent Christon. And so, um, it, which is what, you know, I, I, I confirmed everything I, I, um, 
I wanted to, 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 and I think I managed to say it in the book. I hope I managed to say it in the book. So the curiosity of this, uh, my curiosity about quest, the curiosity about the process of rediscovery has led to reflection on how we can portray historians of ideas, who, um, who transmits whom, where and how, the role of these little people in, um, because Quest is not acknowledged as a, as a major historian by anybody. Um, um, the, you know, the networking among minor figures where it reveals the significance of others, even more agents, you know, like Mary Louise Quest or Michel Collinet, I would, uh, would say would be worth um, searching, but always still in this context of France of the 20th century. Um, the discovery of the significance of, of Florence Pistone in the life and work of a couple that was very uh, touching, I think, when their letters during the, the war at, to the front, you know, they kind of referred to Florent Tristan as one of their, you know, sort of um, the thing that it was like a comfort, uh, a comfort symbol for them to keep to keep going in the, in the worry and the hope that they would be together again. Um, there is there is remaining um, work to be done on the legacy of the letters. Um, but my Louise's letters, I think, might reveal, you know, more about how she actually helped the man and how she inspired him to, to work on uh, Florent Tristan. And, uh, you know, so uh, coming back to how we can reflect about, you know, the, the, the discipline of labor history, I think I've, I've, I've challenged, I've challenged, uh, uh, I think I've challenged some, um, some well-known historians uh, in my book to, you know, come on, let's think about agency, gender, um, uh, in, in, in a broader, in a broader way, in, in, in a kind of, a broader way, yet more uh, in-depth way of, uh, you know, not just dismissing. Okay, f women didn't get the vote until 1944 in France, or the, you know, the Socialist Party wasn't interested in giving uh, women the vote. Therefore, women, you know, can, feminists dismiss the Socialist Party, and the, the, all those kind of old arguments. I think we have to, you know, I was saying, let's get past these and find a meaningful way of of, of tracing the of tracing the, the fate of his of of, of people and in. in in ideas and ideas in history. So um, I think I'm going to finish there. I don't know if I've run over time, but I'm sure I have. <laughs>